it's so great to be with you here uh, today. Man, whether you're joining us here in service or whether you're watching online, um, it, it really is my privilege to just be able to serve you for the next uh, half an hour and hopefully build something into your life and, and help instill something into your life as well. My wife, Nikki, and I, we love elevation. We do love being part of this family. We do feel like we've been adopted in and we're family straight away. We love our lead pastors, Ross and Kathy. And so big shout out to them. We really honor them. It's a privilege to be able to serve their vision. Uh, also to Miles and Bonnie as well. Um, we just love uh, your executive pastors, our executive pastors too. It's been a heck of a journey uh, walking with this, this, this church network together, it's a real privilege of mine. Um, you know, a little bit about me, uh, my name is Luke, as you know now. Uh, my wife, Nikki, uh, we, we've been married for about 10 years this year, actually. And we've got two kids, um, Georgia, who is three, and she is a three major. she really is. Um, and uh, Leonardo, he is one. And uh, he's a little nugget, we talk in grunts. Um, it's just fantastic. We passed to the Cairns location, so great honor to be able to do that. We also have a couple of businesses. My wife is a clinical psychologist, so she is a pastor, but also has an online clinic where she sees people from all around Australia. And we have two candy stores as well. Um, we, we own two candy stores in Cairns, and so my wife quite literally does call me her sugar daddy. Um, she does. I wish she did, but she doesn't. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's great to be here. And I want to get into the Word today. We are going to continue the series that Pastor Miles launched last week, talking about the heart of the Father. That central to discovering who we are is understanding the heart of Father God. Uh, at the very core of understanding our identity is understanding who God says He is and what God says about us. A.W. Tozer and Pastor Miles shared this last week, but A.W. Tozer gave this great quote. He said, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Or in other words, our perception of God the Father is the starting point of both a healthy or an unhealthy sense of identity. And the more clearly we see the Father, the more clearly we see ourselves and the healthier our identity is. But here's the thing that I find, uh, I've been in church for a long time, I've been a pastor for a while now, but I grew up going to church, and I've heard a lot of messages about the love of the Father, about Father God, uh, His feelings towards me, my identity. I've sung a lot of songs, like we did, you know, um, God is um, faithful, God is kind, God is love. We were singing that tonight, uh, tonight, this morning, right? Um, and I, I've done that a lot, but I found it super easy, and maybe this is your experience, that I can sing those songs, and I can be impacted by a message, and it's real, and it moves me, but when I walk out these doors, whether it be in a day, or a week, or a month, or whatever it might be, uh, I kind of lose sight of the thing that I've learned. It's like I was impacted by this sense of, man, I have this identity in God, but when I walk out the doors, it's kind of like I forget about it. Has that ever happened to you before? It's like you you get impacted in a series, and then you kind of lose sight of it, and it comes around the next year, and there's a similar series, like, oh, that's right, and my identity in Christ, right? And it makes me wonder, why is that? How, How could that happen? Did it mean that God didn't impact me? That wasn't a real move of God on my life? No, of course not. It was a real move of God. The problem is not our knowledge of God and and understanding that. I mean, that's one aspect of it. But I think the problem is also the fact that we've got established patterns of thinking in our mind that influence and dictate our sense of self-identity. And when we walk out these doors, there are literally thousands of voices all around us speaking into our sense of identity, whether that be from social media to advertising to our interactions with other people, to our experiences in the workplace, in the home, uh, in our schools, in our universities. We've got all of these voices speaking to us, and if we're not careful, they can easily drown out the voice of the Father, our understanding of the Father's 
heart, right? And so what have we got to do is not just about understanding the Father's heart more, although that's one side of the coin. I think the other side of the coin is figuring, figuring out a way to make sure that we are uh, uh, dealing with these other voices trying to speak to us. You know, um, Brad made the joke about it, but my last name is Nutrafora, it's Sicilian. Um, I've got Sicilian heritage. Uh, I was born in Australia, but I have dual citizenship to, to Italy. And so I, I, I'm really interested in things like what your name means. Like we picked our, our kids' names to mean different things. Georgia Allegra means um, farmer. And uh, <laughs> I didn't think it because of that. Um, and it means uh, <laughs> cheerful or joyful. And it's like she's going to sow joy, right? Like that's what her legacy is going to be in people's lives. Leonardo means as bold as a young lion. I'm like, I love that name. That's good. Um, but our last name, I wanted to figure out what it was all about, what it means. And so I went to a relative of mine. Um, he's from Sicily. He migrated to Australia. He's an older gentleman now. He's a cousin of mine. His name's Giovanni. And so we went, and uh, I went, and I went and had a, a coffee with him. We sit down. He's got the espresso, the biscotti. You know, he, he's like, do you want something to eat? I'm like, oh, no, thank you. Listen, if you've got an Italian background, you know this. The question, do you want to eat? There's only one answer. Even if you're not, whether you're hungry or not, is irrelevant. Yeah. It's not about you being hungry. It's about manja, manja, right? You've got to eat the food. And so we sit down and we have some food and I'm asking, like, Cousin Johnny, like, our last name, Sicilian, what does it mean? He's got this really thick accent, so he just starts to tell me. He's like, you can see when I ask that question, because of the pride, it just comes out. He's going to tell me. He knows our family history. He's like, okay, I'll tell you about the name of Nutriflora. I'm like, okay, cool. Tell me, what does it mean? He's like, well, the name of Nutriflora, your bisnonno. He comes from a Sant'Austio in Sicilia. He have a ten of brothers, and they come over to Australia, right? I'm like, okay, cool. Get a little bit of family history here. And I'm like, so what does the last name mean? He's like, they bring the name of Nutrafora. It's a good name. It have a good meaning, right? It's a very proud meaning. And so I'm like, cool. Okay, this is going to be good. Um, the way he was talking to me, I'm like, it's going to be champion. It's going to be conqueror. It's going to be like something I can get, you know, this is who I am. And, uh, and, and he's like, the name of Nutrafora, this is what it means. Wait for it. It means the people who are sell a nuts. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, right? He's like, I'm like, are you serious? The people who sell nuts. I was feeling a little bit ripped off. And he says, and I said, really, is that all of me? He's like, it's okay, it's okay. But then, the name is for It means that the people who sell it are nuts. But it also have another meaning. It's a very good meaning. It means the people who are nuts. <laughs> I'm just deflated, right? I'm thinking champion, coming. No, my last name, for the majority of my life, no, in fact, actually, fact, the entirety of my life, I've been called Luke Vincent, the people who are nuts, right? Like my whole life. I was definitely disappointed, this voice of identity speaking to me, right? And so about a year later, you know, I'm, I'm just, I hated this. I was like, I can't believe our last name, the people who are nuts. A year later, I'm studying uh, in my university degree, I did a, a couple of units on ancient Greek. Um, on the on Kinney Greek, which is what the New Testament was majority written in, and uh, we're studying this one coin of a of a ruler named Antiochus Epiphanes. Right, he ruled in about second century BC uh, over the Seleucid Empire, and I noticed something, and it should come up on the screen. I know this is him here uh, in Greek. It says Vasilius Antiochus Theos Epiphanes, right, which means um, King Antiochus. Uh, God manifests, right? He was deified himself. He was he was the people who were nuts. But anyway, um, and then I notice on the bottom this one line here, and you know what it says? It says Nikiforos. I'm like Nikiforos. That kind of sounds like Nikifora. And so I went to my lecture, and I'm like, do you think this is like? You know what? I think this might be the root word in Greek of what your Italian name means, right? I'm like, oh, what does it mean? And you know what it means? Bearer of victory. You're damn right. It means bearer of victory, right? I'm taking that. I'm taking that name on. If I'm going to have to choose between the nut people or the people who are nuts, 
or the bearer of victory, you know what I'm choosing, right? You know what I'm choosing. So now it's Luke Vincent, the bearer of victory. My wife's name is Nikki, which also comes from the Greek word Nike, which means bringer of victory. So her name is literally bringer of victory, bearer of victory. Yeah. Don't mess with my wife. If you take her on, she will beat you, right? It's in her name. Uh, you will get dominated. She will win every single time, right? But, I mean, it, 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 the funny thing is, right, it, it's just such a silly example, but it, it's true what you are listening to. What, what voice are you going to tune into? I don't want to listen to the nut people. I'm tuning into yeah. the bearer of victory. That is mine. I'm claiming it as my own, right? And in the same way, there's thousands of voices trying to speak to our identity. We have got to be intentional about what we choose to incline our ear to when it comes to our identity. And we don't just pick it out of the blue. It's not just based out of our subjective uh, uh, feelings. It's based on the concrete, objective fact of what God the Father says about us. Jesus said this in John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. My sheep listen to whose voice? My voice. Whose voice? My voice, right? Not the voice of a thousand other things. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. As followers of Jesus, we are called to listen to his voice. And what I want to do today, with a bit of time we have left, is I want to look at um, the same story Pastor Miles used, the story of the prodigal son, to uh, identify some of the voices that try to speak to us that we need to tune out. The voices that we need to not incline our ear to and so we can turn our ear to God. Uh, and, and I'm going to bring it, Miles brought it from the perspective of the father, I want to bring it from the perspective of the son. So let me recap the story because I recognize we may have guests here today. Or maybe you don't know this story. That's totally cool. We're going to go over this, okay? It's in Luke chapter 15. Now, Luke is one of the four eyewitness accounts of the life, teaching, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, uh, and, and Luke records what Jesus was teaching. And Jesus tells this parable. Now, parable is a parable is a fictional little story um, that he Jesus would use to communicate truth about his kingdom. It's not just like a, a heavenly, uh, earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's kind of, it's cute to say that, but it's more about Jesus showing us what does his kingdom look like? What, what, how does his kingdom operate? And he would tell these stories to try and communicate these principles to us, and this is one of the stories. And, and he tell, tells about the fact that there's two sons, okay, an older brother and a younger brother. The older brother was faithful. The older brother worked well for his father. The older brother was to the family, but the younger brother comes to his father and asks for the inheritance before his father died. His younger brother comes in and says, give me the money, and he takes the money and he goes off to a far land and he squanders his wealth in wild living and, 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 and just living crazily. But a famine hits that land and because he's used up all his money, this younger son is now thrown into poverty. He's destitute. In fact, he is the only place he can work and find work is a piggery where he's so hungry he looks at the food and he wants to eat it himself. And Jesus goes on from verse 17 of Luke 15 and he tells us what happens when this younger son is sitting in the pigsty, he's sitting in the piggery and the kind of the, the epiphany that he has. He says this, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. So I'm going to go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned. Now in a parable, every character we can relate to, the father in this parable is representative of God the Father. Okay, We're meant to put God in the shoes of this father. Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, um, Still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Now, I think we're missing a little bit of scripture here. I'm just going to double check on my notes here. Um, and his son said to him, um, here's one I prepared earlier. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, but this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. 
It's a beautiful picture of the Father's heart, compassion, love, mercy. The Father runs out all of the things that Pastor Miles spoke about last week. But let's put ourselves in the shoes of the Son. He sees the Father running. He embrace, has the embrace of the He experiences all these things, and yet still His words are, I am not worthy. Even though you're treating me the complete opposite of what I expected, I, I'm just, I feel so unworthy. Even though your voice is coming through loud and clear, I still feel unworthy. Why the disconnect? Why the disconnect? Why couldn't he see it? Because he was listening to more than just that voice. I imagine there was many voices going on in his head, speaking to his identity. And I just want to identify two from this story that maybe will help us when we leave this place and we think about the heart of of the Father. The first one is this, is the voice of condemnation. we got to tune out the voice of condemnation so we can tune into the voice of the Father. Right. I mean, this son has done some dodgy things. He's taken his father's money, he has taken his father's money, he has disgraced the family name, he has a long list of errors, mistakes, and sins. I imagine that as he was walking home, the weight of what he had done was sitting on his Shoulders So much so that he decided that I'm not worthy to be a son anymore. There's nothing I could do to ever attain sonship again. I guess I will settle for being a servant or a slave. That right there is the voice of condemnation. So condemnation will try to convince us that we're disqualified from experiencing the love of the Father. We hear and we sing these songs about the love of the Father, but uh, 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 condemnation says, yeah, but what about what you've done? You could never experience that love. Condemnation will try to convince us that the acceptance of the Father and, and, and the privileges of living in His household are no longer ours to enjoy. Condemnation will hold us back. And what happens is we begin to interact with God, the Father, not like a son or daughter of the house, but as a servant or a slave. Where we never enjoy real intimacy. We keep God at a distance. We don't enjoy the intimacy and relationship that comes with being family. Or we don't enjoy the promises of God and walking His authority and power because we just don't see how we could be part of that heavenly household. Let me ask you a question, whether you're here in this auditorium or whether you are in your living room right now or wherever you are watching online. When you stand before God, do you see yourself as a son or daughter or do you see yourself as a servant? Wow. How do you see yourself? Is it the voice of condemnation that's speaking to your identity right now? See, God calls us to tune that out. The Bible says this in Romans 8, verse 1 to 4. It'll be on the screen, but I'm going to read it from my notes. It says, so now there is no condemnation. Just think about that for a second. Now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. From the tyranny of sin, the tyranny of guilt and shame, it has freed you from that. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. What is this saying to us? It's saying there's no condemnation for us anymore if we are in Christ. Why? Because we earned it? No. <laughs> no. It's not because we have earned it. There was nothing we could do in our own abilities to earn back our sonship with nothing we could do in our abilities to satisfy the requirements of the law. So what did the loving Father do? He sent His own Son to do that for us. And in Jesus... There was a perfect sacrifice. In Jesus was a perfect life. In Jesus was a perfect resurrection, right? He stepped in on our behalf, and it's completely our, our worthiness to be a son or a daughter, our elevation to the household of God is completely independent of anything we could do, good or bad. How often do we play this game where if we've been good this week, we feel like we can draw closer to God? If we've been bad this week, we feel like we can. It's the voice of condemnation. 
the blood of Jesus has been enough. It is more than enough to cleanse you of your sin and wash away your guilt. And so tuning out the voice of condemnation is about in those moments recognizing, hey, this is not the kind of voice I need to listen to. What Jesus did for me is enough. He didn't need to do any more for me. It was more than enough for me to come home. And it's not based on what I've done. It is now based on Him. I'm running to the Father. I'm drawing close. I have an identity in Him because He paid the ultimate price. We've got to tune out the voice of condemnation. Lastly, we've got to tune out the voice of comparison. The voice of comparison. Listen, this was not the only son. Remember, there's two sons. One stayed home. One did the right thing. One worked his butt off for the father. One was faithful. I wonder if while this younger son, though, was walking along the road and thinking about, man, I'm not worthy to be a son because I have a brother and he stayed and he did the right thing. How could I ever measure up to what he has done? There's no way. It is the voice of comparison leading him to feel unworthy. It's like a little tape measure that we have on the inside where when we see something that looks like the perfect standard or the right ideal, we kind of measure ourselves up against it and oftentimes see how much we fall short. That feeds into our identity. And it goes for so many things. It could be the fact that your neighbor bought a new car and you're stoked for them. I mean, it's amazing, but this little tape measure comes out. You know, I could never afford that. I'm not working a good enough job. Maybe I'm, and it speaks to our identity. You are with another family having a barbecue. Their kids are angels. Kids are acting like demons. And you look at it, you're like, you measure, like, what am I doing wrong as a parent? Uh, it begins to affect your identity. You're in church, and someone next to you is like worshiping. They're singing at the top of their lungs. They're completely out of tune, but they're passionate, and they're loving Jesus, and they're having a great time, but you are just feeling so dry and so empty. And, and you're like, maybe I'm just not a good Christian, the tape measure comes out, right? And sometimes it's hard to hear the voice of the Father when all we are doing with our lives is just measuring ourselves up to everyone and everything and seeing how far we fall short. When really what we're called to do is measure ourselves against the only thing that matters. See, for the Father, when He saw His Son, He wasn't comparing Him. When He was running home, when He was coming home and the Father was running out, He wasn't comparing Him to the other Son. The only measurement he was making was the measure of his own love that he felt for this son that was coming home. The only measurement that we are called to make when it comes to our identity is the measure of God's love for us. Philippians 2 talks about this. It says, For Christ, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be held onto, but made himself a servant, a slave, taking on the likeness of men, Right? And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Hey, just as the keys come and we bring this to a close. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, Romans 5 8. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We've got to measure ourselves against what Jesus did. Being in very form God, it's the second person of the Trinity, living in perfect glory and majesty and relationship with the Father. Eternal. Co-eternal with God. Omnipotent. omniscient, All of those things. And yet he decides to humble himself and take on the form of a man. Like, and not just for 30 so years when he walked the earth, but forever. Jesus, when he was resurrected, he was still in the form of a man. He humbles himself so much that he takes on the form of men, then he becomes obedient to death and death on the cross. He, he takes on the weight of sin and shame and guilt of the whole world upon himself, and then he is humiliated through a Roman crucifixion, naked, scorned. In Roman culture, crucifixion was so abhorrent that you wouldn't talk about it in polite society. It was like the unnameable thing. And yet here is the master, the king of glory, the creator of the universe, bleeding out on a Roman cross. Look at the distance. That's the measure of God's love for you. That's the measure 
of God's love and the foundation of your identity and my identity. That when the voice of comparison comes and the little measuring tape comes out saying, measure yourself against this person or against that thing or against this event, we can tune that voice out by saying, I'm not going to measure myself against that. I'm going to measure myself against the value and the worth and the love and the infinite sacrifice that my Jesus has made for me. I'm going to be intentional about this and change the way I think. So my focus is on this voice, the voice of the Father, not the voice of comparison. Hey, maybe today, yeah, there's a lot of voices speaking to you about your identity. Maybe it's condemnation. Maybe it is comparison. Let God wants to bring you freedom today. God's calling you to be intentional. It begins here, but it doesn't end here. It's not just an experience that's going to change. It's going to be active and intentional and saying, okay, I'm not going to listen to that. I am going to listen to the voice of God. But it can begin here today. We believe it can change your life. One of us has to stand to our feet. If you're at home and you're watching online or wherever you might feel, if you, if you can, you can stand with us. Unless it's going to be super weird in a cafe and everyone's going to be wondering what you're doing. It's all right. I mean, we do you, man. We do you. We make it today. As we close our eyes, we just bow our heads for a second. Let's look at the moment for us.
Hey, thank you so much for watching another message from our teaching team. We hope that it encourages you and it speaks life into your situation. Hey, while you're here, why don't you subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay connected. You can also visit our website, elevationchurch.com.au and get connected that way. Uh, remember, we will be back every single Sunday, 10, 15 a.m. So we'll see you then.